In just a few days, we're going to be gathered together for Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah is a few different things. It's the beginning of the new year. The rabbis tell us it's the birthday of the world. It's also this time of tshuva, of repentance. We ask those we've wronged this past year for forgiveness. We come to synagogue and we ask God for forgiveness during this time of judgment up until Na'ilah, the moment the gates of justice are closed, the end of Yom Kippur. But if I asked you, what do we do on Rosh Hashanah? Most people's answer is we pray, right? We sit in synagogue and we pray. It's the primary act, not just Rosh Hashanah, of every Shabbat, every holiday, actually every day, three times a day as Jews were required to offer the prayers, to say the Amida. Three times a day. And there's a very rigid structure to what time, how, when, which words. These are the words we say on a weekday, on Shabbat, we don't say those. On holidays, we say these instead. And if you forget this, do you have to repeat it or not? As Jews, we love rules. Many of us might not follow them, but we've made a whole bunch of them over not just the decades, but the centuries and the millennia. Of when we say what and how we say it and where we say it and what direction we face and what's the intention we should have. And if you didn't do this, do you go back? Do you do that? Do you do this? Do you do that? It's incredibly structured and rigorous. And so ultimately, what loses out and what's the keva, the set rules and structure of prayer, is often the kavanah, the intention behind it, the meaning. Prayer, to many of us, at least colloquially, it means when you cry out to God, when you ask for what you need, when you ask God for help, when you ask God for comfort, for support, for strength, when you cry out to the heavens, not just for yourself, but your family, your loved ones, for a story you saw in the news or heard from someone of an awful tragedy that affected somebody. Those moments of sincerity that we think of as prayer. But halakha often defines prayer as not that. That's nice, but prayer is, or if you prayed or not, is very structured and rigorous. It's a question of, did you check all the right boxes and say this at the right time, in the right way, the right words? And so the question is, how do we balance that? There's a Hasidic story I love, and it's about Rosh Hashanah. It's about a young boy. Family isn't very wealthy. They live out in a small village far away from the larger village, far away from the town, far away from the city. And the family has a few sheep and goats, and the boy spends his days being a shepherd, looking after the herd while his father earns some money. But finally, one year, as the boy turns 13, the father decides it's time to take him with him when he goes into the city for the holidays. And so they travel together. The boy is not sure what to expect. He's never been to shul before. The father's never dragged him out. He has no religious education. The family couldn't afford it. They couldn't provide it. And the father takes them to the big synagogue in the city for the holidays. And the boy is sitting there. And he doesn't know what's happening. Everyone around him standing and sitting, and they're bowing, and they're praying, and they're shaking back and forth and forward and backwards. They all seem to know what's happening. The guy on the bima says one thing, and everyone says something in return. And the boy's feeling more and more uncomfortable, more and more out of place. He can't read any Hebrew. And the boy keeps reaching into his pocket for his flute. When he spends his afternoons watching the sheep, he sits under the tree and he plays flute. And he wants to play. And his father keeps saying, no, don't do that, it's forbidden. And the boy keeps asking, can I play the flute? The father says, no, again and again. Right? It's forbidden to play an instrument on a holiday or Shabbat. Finally, the father's so afraid his son's going to do it, he takes it and you know, sets it aside. But at some point, 
while everyone was davening the Amida, right, the big silent prayer. And the sanctuary is quiet except for just the, the murmurings as everyone's mouthing the words and saying them to themselves. Everyone's in great concentration. The boy manages to sneak the flute from his father and starts to play. Everyone's shocked. The father's embarrassed, appalled. Everyone's in disbelief that some kid would be playing an instrument in the sanctuary on the holidays. And the rabbi quiets everyone down and tells them that they were wrong. That everybody mistook what the boy did for something that was a desecration of holiness, of sanctity. But actually what the boy did was he praised God with the sincerest form of prayer. With something that came from his heart, something that he felt moved spontaneously to offer. Because he didn't know the words. He didn't know the rituals. He didn't know the routines and the choreography of the service. But he offered something deep from his heart, his own gift the only gift he had, the beautiful melody he could make on that flute and those notes. And the rabbi said that it was those notes that lifted their prayers up to heavens. It was those notes that ensured that their prayers were accepted by God that year. The story is even better in the original Hebrew because there's a play on words. Because the Hebrew word for praise is halal, and the word for desecration, mechalal, and the word for flute as well, all play off of each other. And the boy's saying he wants to praise God, but the father's hearing he wants to desecrate God by not following the rules. This is a lovely story, but why am I sharing this with you? Because we often get so caught up in the rules, in the rituals, in the keva, in the structure of prayer, and the structure of the Sidor, in this case for the holidays, the Maksor, in making sure that we get all of the prayers that are required in, that we get them in at the right times, that we forget about what they really mean. Often the words themselves, especially the English translation, and our Maksor is a very old translation, a lot of thou's and O oh lords, and language we can't really relate to. Prayers on topics that might be hard at first to relate to. But I encourage you this holiday to really sit and try to look at those words, if you don't know the Hebrew, to look at the English. To imagine what was going through the mind of the author of those words. What emotions they felt. What experiences they may have had. Because even though their day-to-day -day life and wants and needs might be very different and foreign to ours, the emotions they felt the fear of the unknown, the worry and concern for their loved ones, for their family, for the Jewish people. Their faith that goodness prevails, and yet their fear because they see evil rising around them. Their emotions are emotions we've all felt, especially this past year. The Safat Emet Another Hasidic rabbi is a drosh on our parsha this week, where it says that they all stood before God. He compares it. He compares it to a moment, an earlier story. Where after Cain kills Abel, Cain stands before God compares it to where our patriarch stood before God and talked to God. He compares it to the prophets who stood before God and spoke to God. And he tells us that there's a reason that the evening prayers are a little bit different than the rest of the prayers of the day. Halakha, Jewish law, tells us there's an exact time you have to pray the shacharit amida by. You have to say the shema in the morning by. There's an exact time you have to say the musaf amida by. There's an exact time you have to stop in the afternoon, the mincha service, or else you're too late for it. But the nighttime service doesn't have a fixed time. Any time from nightfall to sunrise, you can say the evening Amida. And he says, it's because in the darkness, that's where our hearts speak. 
that it's in the darkness when we forget about the structure and instead we pray from our hearts, we pray from our souls. And he compares it in our Parsha when they stood before God, the entire nation, to each of those patriarchs, each of those prophets who stood before God and poured their hearts out. Sometimes to confess their sins, like Cain did. Sometimes, like, like Abraham, to pray on behalf of others, like he did for Sodom and Gomorrah. Sometimes, like Moses, to pray on behalf of our people, or to ask God for our own needs, like he did, his dreams of entering the land. Sometimes God answers those prayers, sometimes God doesn't. But he says that that's the moment of true prayer. We offer the words that we really mean sincerely from our heart. So my invitation to all of us this Shabbat is to imagine what it is to stand before God. To prepare ourselves for in a few days when we gather together again for Rosh Hashanah. We gather together again a week after that for Yom Kippur. What it means to be standing before God. As we look through the words of the Moxor and offer the prayers written by those who came before us. As we try to pray within the structure and the rules within the framework that's been given to us, we also make space and time to stand before God, to open our hearts, to offer the words that come from the depths of our souls, for our own needs, for our family and our loved ones, for the Jewish people all around the world, and for the world itself. Shabbat Shalom.